Welcome to WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast. This episode was made possible by a generous sponsorship from AstraZeneca. For more information, visit AstraZeneca.com. In this episode, Taryn Grome, editor of Pharma Voice magazine, meets with Dr. Susan Galbraith, Senior VP and Head of Research and Early Development, Oncology R&D at AstraZeneca. Dr. Galbraith, welcome to the WOW podcast program. We're delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. I would love to hear about your career journey and why the area of oncology is of such importance to you. Well, from being a little girl, I always uh, had an aspiration to be a doctor. And I don't really know why, because there aren't any in my uh, immediate family. Um, I have early recollections of being in a, a doctor's office that stimulated um, that desire. And, and, and so, you, you know, I was very determined through school that that's my goal and what I wanted to achieve. But I didn't really know what kind of a doctor I wanted to be. Um, and when I um, graduated from medical school and started working at a hospital, I got assigned to uh, different rotations. And actually, I didn't get the rotation through jobs that I initially applied for. And the rotation I had um, included an oncology um, period. So um, what I found when I was doing that was that I enjoyed the opportunity to connect with patients because because people were having chemotherapy courses, they would come back regularly and you get to know them and their families. And that's always been something that I've enjoyed. Um, I'm an extrovert and I, I like getting to know people and understanding of that. So that was important. Secondly, um, I found the range of clinical signs and symptoms that you got in oncology really interesting. But what really sparked my interest um, was I remember I went to a seminar on the mechanism of action of a, 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 a drug. It was actually a topoisomerase inhibitor. And I remember sitting there thinking, wow, this is really fascinating. And then it sparked other questions in my mind, like, you know, why does cancer happen in the first place? What else might we be able to do to address it? And it was that combination of the personal interaction with patients the clinical stimulation and particularly the scientific interest in the area that meant that once I'd had that um, period uh, of experiencing oncology, I was hooked and there was no turning back from it. So so what then happened is that I was um, basically doing uh, residency training in oncology and had the opportunity uh, to be involved in the PhD. And honestly, that came at a time when it was um, uh, it's, a, it's a time when I was, uh, we, was, we were starting a family. I was married um, and was interested in uh, you know, having, having children at that point. But having children plus working long hours with on call is a challenge. Uh, and actually doing a PhD during that period meant that I didn't have to do the on call. So although it would be arduous doing the PhD, it's actually in some ways easier to plan for a combination of, of work and a young family. Um, so you know, I, I, I did the PhD. I really enjoyed it and got in, engaged into the science for that. And then towards the end of that PhD, um, I had been working on a, a compound that was um, at the time owned by a small biotech company. And then they licensed it to a large pharmaceutical company, Bristol Myers Squibb. Because I've been involved in both the some of the preclinical science in the laboratory, but also in the phase one trial design, I got invited. Um, by BMS to um, speak to them about the work that we've been doing and talk to them about the translational science that we, we've had. Um, and as a result of that meeting, I then got um, an email that basically said, would you be interested in, in, a, in a job within BMS? And honestly, at that point, I hadn't really uh, considered it. But again, it came at a time which um, was made it a possibility to, to move my husband uh, who's an engineer and worked for Ford Motor Company was willing to take a bit of a risk um, at that, that point in his in his career um, and so to cut a long story short um, we decided to to take the opportunity move across the Atlantic and into industry at the same time and we took our two small children with us who were two and four at the time um, to the United States and I ended up working for BMS you know, uh, for nine years, I hadn't really thought it was going to work out that way. I'd initially assumed it was going to be two years and then I might come back. Um, 
you know, and I, I was involved in the early oncology group at Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, spent nine years there, learned a huge amount, uh, great opportunities, and then came back to the UK in 2010 to take a role with AstraZeneca. That's a big leap to make. Um, and how did you find that transition with a new country, two small children, a big new job? That's a lot to manage. Um, yeah, well, I have to say it's very interesting. You have the sort of um, burning boats analogy, which is my husband had given up his job in order for us to move uh, across the Atlantic. And actually, the drug that I'd spent four or five years working on for my PhD, when I finally arrived in the United States, and there'd been a little bit of delay because I had to finish off my specialist training. When I finally arrived, um, two weeks after I arrived, um, actually the, the drug was was stopped due to a safety finding in, in phase one. So I can honestly say at that point, if I'd had a choice, <laughs> um, if I had a choice, I might have chosen um, to go back to something that I knew more and was and was safer. But, you know, I'd, I'd literally uh, almost burnt my boats. So I felt I had the obligation to make it work. Um, and that was a very interesting experience and one that I draw on in a later career, um, because what it meant was that I had to abandon the, some of the things that I thought I knew, recognize that I didn't know the things that I needed to know in order to be successful in this ne next phase and get on with learning them. And I guess through all the years of medical school and postgraduate exams and other things, the one thing that I knew was that whilst I didn't know everything, I was capable of learning. <laughs> so I had faith in my ability to learn. Um, I was of course supported by my husband, um, but yes, it was a bit scary, in all honesty. But frankly, without that experience, I wouldn't have ended up doing what I did next, which was uh, not studying the same mechanism of action that I'd been working on in my PhD, but getting involved in uh, immuno-oncology, an area which, honestly, I was quite sceptical about at the time. I'll tell you a story that, that when I was at medical school, one there were two courses, which when I got to the end of, I thought, thank God. I, you know, I can I can throw away the textbook, pass the exam, don't need that anymore. One was immunology and the other was um, statistics. And I was wrong on both counts <laughs> and came to regret <laughs> throwing away the um, the books. But so what I did was I went down the, the corridor to the discovery labs. I spoke to um, uh, a, a good friend and colleague, um, Maria Jurikunkel, who was um, uh, involved in this immuno-oncology project. Um, I borrowed her copy of Reut's immunology and relearned what I should have learned properly in, in medical school and got involved in that. You know, it's it's interesting how one door closes and another one opens and you still have to go find the book. That's a great story. Um, wow, talk about, um, I don't know if it's fate or what, but it really led you to where you are today. Um, and, and how did that early experience really frame how you go about now thinking about the drug development process and looking for quality target selections. Um, I know that this is a priority for you at AstraZeneca. Um, so how did this all change your approach? Well, again, I think, as I said, I, I was somewhat skeptical um, of the whole immuno-oncology idea at the beginning, because actually there'd been a lot of failure at that point. Um, and another vignette I guess that stays with me is I also remember when I was a junior doctor um, in in Cambridge years before that um, having a conversation about antibodies and uh, talking to somebody who who said oh that you know th these are never going to be real drugs um, and it just reflects that actually when technology is emerging there are often a series of failures before success comes through so it's actually looking at what's not yet working you know, um, things that are near misses, if you like, and what you can learn from that and apply to the next problem. So I think in terms of approaching um, discovery for uh, oncology drugs, first of all, the technological improvements, the genomic analyses, the ability for using things like CRISPR gene editing to enable uh, functional genomic screening means that the level of target validation and understanding of the disease biology is vastly greater than it was 20 years ago. Uh, and by understanding that properly and understanding what's driving cancer in multiple different um, patients' um, backgrounds, you've got a much better idea of what you might need to do to fix it. 
So I think the quality of target validation is one piece that's important. The other thing is that um, the reason why I was I became excited about the drug that is now uh, ipilimumab when I saw a presentation of the initial phase one data was the quality of the response and the responses that had been seen, even though it was a relatively small data set, there was clearly something different and meaningful in the quality of the responses. So I think the other message would be, you know, always listen to the investigators that are involved in the clinical trials and always take account of um, the patients that are doing particularly well for some reason. You can learn a huge amount from that, and that is a useful guide in um, working out which drugs are likely to be successful. So, you know, we have um, something we call the five R's process within AstraZeneca, which talks about the, the elements that you need to get right in a drug discovery that increase the probability of success in, in the clinic. And, you know, and part of that is about target validation. Part of it is about the design of the drug to make sure that you can hit that target effectively in um, a real patient. Part of it is about selecting the patients for the right drug by understanding what the individual drivers um, of, of cancer are in that individual patient and matching the drug to the patient effectively. Um, part of it is about understanding the safety profile and then understanding where you might position the drug in order to generate value. So those are those are factors that, 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 that come through. Um, but, but beyond those things that you can write down on a piece of paper, I think the other lesson is always look at the raw data, always talk to the people that have got first-hand experience and, and you know, apply that, uh, if you like, some element of qualitative judgment on top of all of the uh, detailed analytical data that you can have, and it's putting those together that enable making the appropriate decisions. Do you think this approach is generally lacking across the industry going in and talking to those investigators? Is this something unique for you all at AstraZeneca under your leadership? Well, the point of really, really talking to the investigators is a theme that, uh, that Jose Baselga, who leads the oncology team here, is always emphasizing um, to us. And again, it resonates with, with me. So I'm not sure it's unique, um, but I think there is a particular emphasis from my perspective, and it resonates with the experiences I've had of where I've been able to work out from what you see in early development um, that there's a potential of seeing something that is um, perhaps missing just from the abstracted data. So there's another example of this. Um, which is in terms of the development of, of, of a LAPRIP, a PARP inhibitor. Uh, again, um, you know, just after I joined AstraZeneca, um, this, this was a drug that was, um, you know, going to be stopped in, in development. And there were a couple of things that struck me. One is that um, the investigators in particular were very passionate about the fact that they'd seen quality durable responses in patients treated with ovarian cancer and breast cancer amongst other cancers um, in the early development of this of this drug and in fact they were quite angry um, in some ways with AstraZeneca for the potential of, of, of closure of the, of the program. That struck me and so when you looked at the data as well there was data from a, um, um, a, a randomized phase two study in um, second line um, ovarian cancer. That means after um, patients have had an original chemotherapy and often debulking surgery, um, they often have a response, but then, you know, typically um, response doesn't last forever and the, and the cancer comes back. In that second line setting, um, people were again treated with platinum based uh, chemotherapy and then randomized to uh, a laparib or placebo. And the overall data uh, from that study. Was, was good in terms of progression-free survival, but at the time, um, the organization felt that in order to get regulatory approval, we would need overall survival benefit. And the study was really too small to have seen a, a statistically significant improvement in that. Plus, there was, a there was a concern about the overall size of the population and whether that was going to be um, you know, a large enough group to make it a commercially viable um, product. But the thing that struck me when you looked at the data um, was that there was a subgroup of patients, those patients that had a BRCA mutation, um, who seemed to be deriving particular benefit. 
And that was actually consistent with the preclinical signs that had been done and the, um, some of the early clinical data. So what I did was get involved in just making sure that we got the biomarker data to understand the BRCA status for all of the patients that were involved in that study before making the decision. And actually, what that showed was a remarkable uh, effect in that subgroup. And because of that analysis, that led to the um, initial approval in the, uh, in the European Union um, for an ovarian cancer and helped to support the initial approval in, uh, in the United States as well. And subsequent trials have continued to show the benefit of this in that subgroup. So many of the um, many of the assumptions that had been made, you know, which were viewed as being highly analytical, weren't the correct assumptions because they hadn't been framed in the right way. Actually, the BRCA mutant population in a platinum and sensitive group was higher than people had assumed. The duration of response was better than people had assumed. Um, and it was possible to get approval based on progression-free survival, not overall survival. So it was, again, another lesson in um, the assimilation of all the information available on a project in order to make the right um, decisions. And of course, we've learned a huge amount more now than we knew then. Um, but I think that instinct to see all of the data and the investigator input in an early point in a, in a, a, a program is, is incredibly important. That is incredible. What a story. Um, and congratulations and kudos to you for really recognizing um, the need to go deeper and to understand what those data read out to be and the eventual result of a drug being approved in a much needed space. Um, that's amazing. I'm struck by the fact that because these are cancers that were uh, that are predominantly affect women, do you think that played a role um, in this scenario because you are a woman and you were looking at the data differently, perhaps? I'm not sure that that's, um, that's com completely true, to be honest. Um, I, it, it was not so much the fact that I was looking at it differently because I, because I am a woman. Um, I was looking at it differently because I was struck by a piece of information that, uh, that you know, that others that were making that decision um, weren't taking into account. I, th I think okay. that's the, that, that, that would be the way that I would um, frame it. And again, when you're in science, you're often taught to be highly analytical, right? So, um, you know, don't be emotional. What, if, what I think is really important is that um, to use all of the parts of your brain when you're trying to make decision making. For sure, um, we're all subject to biases and being aware of the biases that you're potentially subject to is really important when you're trying to frame the right decision. Um, but at the same time, there are, there are aspects of decision making, the aspects of the data that you've got access to, the information that you've got access to that are harder to put down in a highly analytical quantitative way and those still might be very useful pieces of information that need to be weighed up in the decision so i wouldn't ignore it when something feels incongruent or not quite right there's something there's a there's an instinct about about it i would use that as a prompt to delve deeper and ask other questions in it perhaps in a different way if that makes sense absolutely you, with more than 20 years of experience in drug discovery and development and ascending to increasingly more senior leadership positions, we don't often see women in those kinds of roles. Did you encounter any barriers based on your gender? So at the time that I went to medical school, you know, it was, it was almost 50-50 in the distribution of the, of the entrance. You just contrast that with um, just a generation earlier, my mother wasn't allowed to do A-levels, which is the sort of 16 to 18 year old um, qualifications that, that uh, um, uh, teenagers get at school that enables them to get the grades to go to university in the UK. So my mother wasn't able to do science based A-levels purely because of her gender. I was able to go to medical school and uh, graduate and do all the things that I've done. And I, I honestly say that I don't feel that I directly experienced, um, you know, 
bias in that way. What I would say is that you mentioned before that having a um, very busy career and very demanding career, as well as having children, um, is isn't easy. Um, and I think a lot of people recognise that. I'm very fortunate to be supported, um, you know, in, in in many ways, both by my husband, but also extended family, etc. So able to to find a way to navigate through those challenging years, and I think that that makes a difference. You know, I've also benefited from um, mentoring and support at key transition points in my career, um, which are invaluable. I think. Um, honestly, I think that um, you know one of the benefits of going to the United States was about the level of ambition um, that was possible. You know that I think there were more role models, there was more possibility and opening of the um, possibility. I think quite often people self-limit. I mean, I can remember before I moved into industry, my husband, as I said, was working for Ford, and um, he would be telling me, you know, stories of corporate America, if you like, and I can remember thinking, well, I could never do that. <laughs> um, that phrase, I could never do that, is something that I hear. Um, more frequently than I'd like to from young women in early stages of their career. And I would encourage people not to self-limit because you don't actually know what you're capable of until you really put your mind to it. And if you do really put your mind to it, you will surprise yourself and others maybe about exactly what you are capable of. Um, so, you know, I would, I would frame it in that context. There's clearly still a gap um, a gender gap, particularly at more senior levels, and you're right to point that out. I think much has been done to help uh, you know, address that, but there's more still. And one of the things is about making sure that at those key years when people want to take um, uh, you know, time from their careers, uh, etc., that there is the level of support and not a diminishment in the ambition level, um, and certainly not a self-limiting um, uh, you know, framing of what the opportunity might be. I think that's a really important point. Excellent. Would you consider yourself to be a role model, though? Well, one of the things I genuinely enjoy doing is mentoring um, women at more junior levels of uh, different organisations. Because as I said to you, I've benefited from that support at key points of my career. And so I find it rewarding to be able to give a little bit of advice and help to other women, you know, who are asking questions about how things might be possible or how they can um, make shifts. Um, you know, uh, I, I think anybody in a senior position, it, it's, a, you know, an important and rewarding thing to do to help others at more junior levels. What are some of those key insights or those um, pieces of leadership advice that you provide to those that you mentor? So um, perspective is the first thing. I always found when I was being mentored that somebody would come with a different perspective than the one that I had was struggling with if it was a particular problem, um, et cetera. And that different way of framing a problem often was a first step to enabling something that was a solution. So that's one piece of advice. Secondly, again, I've mentioned don't self-limit in terms of assumptions that you make about it think about not whether or not you could ever do a role but what are the skills and experience that you would need to be successful in that role and then what might you need to do now in order to gain some of those skills and experience um, i think the final piece is that you've got to enjoy the journey as well as the <laughs> the, the, the destination that it's uh you can often um say oh well you know uh, i'm not necessarily enjoying this bit here, but at least it's going to take me to where I want to be. If you're truly not enjoying what you're doing now, then they probably need to do something to fix that problem because life is short enough that we should enjoy the pieces along the way and the gaining of experience. It's a really rewarding aspect of career development is that you feel that you are better at doing something this year than you were last year. And so long as you're continuing to make that progress, and that you know what you're doing it for, you've got a sense of purpose, um, that those are sustaining elements that can give you resilience through, through your career. 
Excellent. And you certainly are not someone who self-limits. Um, I know that in addition to your role at AstraZeneca, you also co-lead the Cambridge Cancer Center Onco Innovation Group, um, which is an organization that connects Cambridge scientists to the biotech and pharmaceutical companies in the region. Tell me about your work with them and how does that influence your world? Well, you know, I, I think, first of all, just a bit, as a bit of context, that that in order to be successful to change how cancer is treated, we need a whole life science ecosystem to understand the disease. So you need academic centers of excellence that can um, that are really driving to the to the understanding there. We also need a thriving um, biotech sector and all of the skills and experiences that go into that. So it's not just about um, you know wanting AstraZeneca to be successful. I think you want the community of people that are working on this overall problem um, to be enabled. So um, one of the reasons why AstraZeneca moved to Cambridge was to be very close um, and part of um, you know the big life sciences uh, uh, grouping that and cluster, if you like, that exists in in Cambridge. And so to be part of that and to be able to um, collaborate with other members of that of that group. Um, you know, makes makes complete sense. Um, so one of the exciting projects at the moment is that uh, Cambridge is uh, interested in building a, a cancer hospital um, and is bidding and working with the UK government to help foster that. There are also innovations coming out of the Cambridge Cancer Centre um, who, are, who are, like AstraZeneca, very interested in what we might be able to do to treat cancer at an early stage. That's fascinating. And when you're having those discussions, do you see like what the future, I mean, obviously there's future application and you just outlined them, but how soon can we get to those practical applications of some of this? I think one of the things I'm excited about at the moment is you see other technologies which will enable earlier detection of cancer coming in different settings. So um, the UK government has recently announced a, a, a collaboration between the National Health Service here and Grail for a, um, a test that takes circulating tumour DNA and looks at the methylation patterns in that DNA to see if, can, if cancer can be detected early. Really, you know, we know that um, curing cancer requires earlier detection. We've known that for years. So when, when you have cancers like breast cancer, that can be screened for the um, the long term survival outcomes are, are better, but there are several different cancers for which there's no currently available screening test. Esophageal is one, pancreatic cancer is another, ovarian cancer um, is, is is a third. If you could have tests that screen for multiple different cancers simultaneously um, and can do it from a simple blood sample, I think that's incredibly exciting and creates a lot of opportunity to have um, medicines be developed in those earlier stage settings, potentially, um, you know, with implications of changes to the regulatory environment and how we uh, design clinical trials. Um, and I think this kind of uh, revolutionary approach is incredibly exciting opportunity. And I really do think we're going to make significant progress in this over the next several years. It is very exciting. You know, I don't know anyone who hasn't been touched by cancer in some way or another. So when I hear you speak, I'm very optimistic about what the future could be for those who are impacted by all of the different kinds of cancers there are. And I think that's been a revolution as well in the last five to seven years is that it's not just cancer. We're looking at cancer as very individual diseases and even even further, individual individual diseases when we get into the subtypes of the different cancers, um, which makes it more complicated, but also more fascinating, I would think. Yeah, it's a realization of what the true biology is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as human beings, we always stick things into categories. And as understanding grows, um, you shift the categorization based on that. So we used to categorize cancers just by the anatomical site in which they arise. And then when microscopes technology became available, we described the way that they look. That's why with lung cancer, it gets divided into non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer, because the cells that they looked down at the microscope were either small or not small. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that 
that wording has, has gone into the lexicon of, of, of cancer, even though it's not really terribly illuminating. What we know now, of course, is that lung cancer has a, a variety of different genetic drivers because the genomic technology revolution has enabled us to categorize in a different way. So now we know that there's EGFR mutated, mutated cancer, ALK um, translocated um, lung cancer, um, KRAS mutated lung cancer, PDL1 positive lung cancer. And so we are applying different uh, categories to that. And with that has come better understanding of how to tailor treatments to the different categories that we have. But of course, those labels aren't truth either. And, you know, the methylation patterns that happen or the um, permanent inaccessibility or the other things are also factors that need to be taken into account when we're thinking about how we categorize. And so with every technological um, revolution comes an opportunity to see things differently. And through that, seeing things differently, greater insight um, is, is applied and that will enable us to be more successful. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that. I also know that you sit on a couple of different boards. Um, why is board stewardship or serviceship important to you? Well, I've already talked about the fact that I think <clears throat> we need a thriving ecosystem of life sciences. Sure. Um, you, you know, so that, so I, I was interested in doing that. And I also um, thought that it would be a career development opportunity for me to be able to sort of take a board position <clears throat> and you look at the a company's growth from a different perspective when you're sitting on a board um, and understand, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. So that has helped um, me probably be better at the job that I'm doing within AstraZeneca, as well as enabling, um, you know, the biotech you know, company that I sat on the, the board of, I hope, <laughs> um, you know, to, to thrive and to continue to grow. Um, and, and, you know, again, I would encourage these experiences that people can have that would you know help that uh, you know diff different skills again different experiences and different perspectives those always generate uh, growth and development excellent um and finally since this is our woman of the week or wow podcast program tell me about an accomplishment or a career trajectory that uh, influenced your and shaped your career What's that wow moment for you? Well, I've talked to you already about the Laprobe experience. That was definitely one. Um, uh, and another one that I can tell you a, a, a story about is perhaps, um, you know, the early days of developing um, a drug that's now called osimertinib or, or tigrisol. Um, so. When I arrived at AstraZeneca back in 2010, um, AstraZeneca had actually a long um, history of being involved in the uh, kinase inhibitors, particular class, class of drugs of which um, uh, they had uh, Arrestor orgafitinib approved in epidermal growth factor receptor mutated lung cancer, EGFR mutant lung cancer. Um, and what, what they had learned through that experience um, was that this is a type of cancer more common in Asians than in Europeans, but also that following treatment with um, uh, gefitinib, there was a resistance that was occurring due to a second mutation in the EGFR binding site. Um, and so they had designed this program to try and um, address that. And it's, it's an interesting experience because, in fact, um, when Arrestor was originally being developed, there had been a lot of hype and expectation for that. And because at that stage, people didn't really understand about EGFR mutation and been described yet, um, the drug wasn't developed in that selected patient population. And so it went through, um, you know, ups and downs, shall we say, um, with the downs being particularly um, important in affecting, I guess, the culture and the mood within the, within the company. So the development of, of, uh, of osimertinib was really quite important. And um, I remember, we had a, a group of uh, advisors at the time um, who were getting to me. When we had the early clinical data, we'd actually seen um, two patients who'd had a response out of four people that were on the first cohort. And I remember being very excited by that because with the resistance mutation that we expected to see is, was probably going to be happening in about half the patients. And so, so the fact we had two patients responding out of four gave me confidence that <laughs> we're actually likely to be on something. Um, 
you know, on, on, onto something with this with this new drug. Um, so I remember when I got that information, um, I ran up the stairs to the chemistry group and told the chemists that had been involved in the design of it. You know, they were getting responses. I think they looked at me like I was a bit nuts, um, to be honest. But actually, that proved to be true. And you know, the drug did do what it was designed to be to, to, to do. And I think the reason why I tell the story is because um, actually, again, that is something where success was born out of years of, of struggle with the rest of not completely understanding what was going on. And through that understanding and the continu continued persistence on something that was difficult to solve, um, the organization came up with um, you know, a next generation inhibitor, osimertinib, which is now um, shown really strong data in the first line treatment of EGFR mutant lung cancer, and indeed is also in the early stage um, uh, cancer with the Adora data that was that was uh, um, uh, approved for in, in, in the United States um, l last year. And, and again, I think that was just a real lesson in persistence against something that is that is difficult and building on. Uh, the learnings and experience of people that have gone um, before, if you like, and, and established a, a level of, of knowledge. So, you know, if there's one message you want to take away from that, it's the, it's the value of persistence and the value of continued effort against things that are difficult. It's a wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I can't Thank you enough for being with us for our WOW podcast program and sharing so many valuable insights in terms of persistence and not self-limiting and believing in what you do and asking the right questions. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Please note, this interview took place on March 21, 2021, just before the sad passing of Jose Baselga a storied oncology researcher and pharmaceutical executive whose discoveries helped pave the way for new breast cancer therapies. He was Executive VP for Research and Development in Oncology at AstraZeneca. Thank you for listening to this episode of WOW! The Woman of the Week podcast. And thanks to AstraZeneca for making this episode possible. For more information, visit AstraZeneca.com. And don't forget to check out our other WOW! episodes at PharmaVoice.com slash WOW! This 2021 program is copyrighted by PharmaLinks, LLC.